Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by Juniper Networks. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts, tracking down threats and vulnerabilities, and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now a quick word about our sponsor, Juniper Networks. They're empowering you to automate your security, see your networks, and protect your clouds. Juniper Networks has you covered, so your security teams can finally get back to fortifying your security posture. Learn more at juniper.net slash security, or connect with Juniper on Twitter or Facebook. That's juniper.net slash security, and we thank Juniper for making it possible to bring you Research Saturday. And thanks also to our sponsor, Enveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution, enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing life cycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data, all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. This really all started about two years ago now. That's Matt Bing. He's a security research analyst with NetScout's ACERT team. The research we're discussing today is titled Dipping into the Honeypot. In late 2016, with this botnet called Mirai, And Mirai is a Japanese word that means the future. And in many ways, we're living in that future right now. What caught everybody's attention in 2016 was that the Mirai botnet was responsible for these really big DDoS attacks, in particular attacks against Dyn that brought down several of the the DNS services for several major organizations. And what made Mirai really unique besides the DDoS firepower behind it was that it targeted these Internet of Things or IoT devices basically these small underpowered computers that people use for things like video camera recorders. Essentially what they are is really just these small underpowered Linux boxes that are really good at being on the network and being able to generate network traffic, which makes them ideal for using them for DDoS. But what made Mirai unique was that the way that it spread itself, the way it propagated to other IoT devices, was via brute forcing these Telnet usernames and passwords. So Telnet is like a very sort of antiquated remote administration tool, sort of like SSH, but unencrypted. But it's not the fact that it's unencrypted that made IoT targets particularly attractive to Mirai. It's that these IoT devices sometimes will have hard-coded usernames and passwords set by the manufacturer that would allow anybody that knows that username and password to be able to essentially get a Unix shell. So what Mirai did is basically just scan the internet for these IoT devices that had Telnet listening, and it had a a list of 60 usernames and passwords that if it found an open Telnet service, it it would go through these 60 usernames and passwords, try to log in, and if it's successful, it would download a copy of the Mirai binary, execute it, and then that device would essentially be conscripted in the botnet. And the botnet itself would check in with a command and control, and the command and control would tell it to you know, launch a DDoS attack against this particular IP address or whatever, and all the bots would simultaneously start attacking whatever the target was. So the research here that we were really interested in is since Mirai really hit the scene in 2016, and perhaps more importantly, the threat actors behind Mirai released the source code to Mirai, So basically, anybody that had a a modicum of technical skill could very easily build their own Mirai-like botnet. And that's kind of what we've seen a lot in the past two years as these IoT bots sort of evolve, is that the threat actors are adding more and more usernames and passwords to different types of IoT devices to their bots to be more successful in propagating. And they're also sort of shifting tactics a bit So instead of just using Telnet brute forcing, they will also use exploits. So for instance, if there's a vulnerability in like the web management interface of a particular IoT device, uh, we've seen several variants of Mirai that will leverage that exploit in order to propagate. So 
this research here was really uh, kind of born out of the fact that if you have a, a listener out there that is just accepting connections from anybody via this Telnet protocol, you can record what usernames and passwords that the bots are, are attempting to try. So by having this network of honeypots that's around the world, just so we don't have any biases for location, we're able to sort of see what trends emerge and what username and password combinations that these bots are actually trying to use. Let's dig into some basics here before we get into the details. Um, I guess I should start by asking you to uh, just describe, for those who may not know, what exactly is a honeypot and how do you use it? Sure. So a honeypot is basically what we call a deception framework. So in other words, it's some code or program that makes a particular device appear to be vulnerable when in fact it's not. So for instance, our honeypots will appear to be a particular type of IoT device and it will present a Telnet prompt just like a normal IoT device would. If you guess the right username and password, sometimes we'll even let you log in with what is essentially a, a fake shell to record the commands that are being sent. But of course, we're not actually running those commands. We're just appearing to run those commands. So from an attacker perspective, there should be no way for them to tell the difference between an actual IoT device and our honeypot. So this way, you're, you're sort of gathering the, the trade craft of the bad guys by making them think they're getting into a device when they actually aren't. Exactly, exactly. And for these bots in particular, these are automated programs that are trying to, to brute force these telnet usernames and passwords. In other words, it's not somebody behind a keyboard necessarily. It's a bot code that is actually trying to do the exploiting here. So let's dig into some of the details here. Can you take us through uh, what exactly were you doing with these honeypots and what did you learn? Sure. So by recording all these usernames and passwords that the bots are, are trying to use, really what we wanted to do was see how far along we've come since Mirai first hit the scene in, in 2016. So I mentioned that the, the original Mirai had a list of 60 usernames and password combinations that it would try to use to propagate. Well, just in September of this year, we found 1,065 unique combinations of usernames and passwords that, that were attempting to, to log into our honeypot, which is really interesting because that means that the threat actors have taken the Mirai source code, you know, the, the original one that was released in 2016, and they're adding to it. They're trying to be more successful than their competitors because, say, for instance, we're both botnet operators, and I happen to know a particular username and password that's used by one particular type of IoT device. I can infect those devices while if you don't know the username and password, you might not. So it's sort of an evolutionary race between these bots to get the most bots in their botnet. Hmm. We mentioned earlier that these username and passwords are often hard-coded into these devices. Does that mean that they can't be changed? In other words, if, if, I'm, if I'm the first bad guy to an IoT device and I get access to it, if another bad guy comes along, can they boot me out? Is it, is it you know, last person there gets to take advantage of it? Is, is there, if I get in first, is there a way to keep other people from getting in behind me, I guess is what I'm getting at. <laughs> no, I, absolutely. And that's actually one of the first things some of these bots do if they successfully hack an IoT device is they'll, they'll try to kill any other bots that might be running. Mm. But a, a lot of times we don't necessarily see them try to change the default password but sometimes they will like kill the telnet service so that it's not accessible by anybody else. So while their bot is running, you know, no other bots can come in and, and try to kill them. So yeah, it, it very much is a, a push and pull between the threat actors here. Now, what are you seeing in terms of, of where these are originating? Are, are there some uh, usual suspects around the world? No, absolutely. So the top five countries that we saw originate this activity from in September was uh, Russia, China, Brazil, the United States, and South Korea. And so what does that tell you? What, what can you draw from that? We kind of extrapolate from that, but what we can tell from that is that those countries happen to have more vulnerable IoT devices that are accessible on the open internet. So we took that assumption and we tried to figure out if we could tell what particular devices might be more popular in which country just based on the username and password combination that they try. So if I'm bitten by a zombie and, and turn into a zombie, the chances are that the zombie that bit me was also bitten by another zombie at an earlier time. 
Mm. So in other words, if there's a particular bot that targets IoT devices that might be more popular in a certain country, we would assume that we would see more particular username and password combinations coming from that country. So this is sort of the research that, that we try to go into. And sure enough, we, we did see some pretty interesting trends that we highlight in the blog. For instance, a really obvious one is that we see the default username and password for some Huawei devices. We saw sources from China attempting to use that combination more often than from other countries. And of course, Huawei being a Chinese company, we would expect to see more of those devices in China than we would in another country. Let's talk about some of the anomalous results that you got here. There was one that uh, that caught my eye, and uh, I'm going to tread lightly here because it's a family show, but uh, there was <laughs> one that you mentioned uh, from Iran, and the username was mother, and the password was a word that begins with F and rhymes with trucker. And this was a highly ranked username and password combination and I guess that caught my eye because that doesn't strike me as the kind of thing that a manufacturer would use as a as a default uh, username and password. No, no. And that was pretty interesting because the combinations that we saw from Iran, there was a whole five of them in a row that were sort of anomalous, like admin one and password, the one you mentioned, yeah. and 54321. And the answer is I don't really know what the cause of that was. But we were speculating that it could have been one particular type of bot that was more popular in Iran. But you're right that those those usernames and passwords probably aren't being put in there by the manufacturer. But these bots are, are pretty aggressive. So in addition to trying like the backdoor username and passwords, they'll also try some pretty common ones like that, like admin 54321, for instance. I see. So they're just using uh, what are well-known popular combinations because why not? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't cost them anything to add a couple more usernames and passwords to their list. So based on this research, what are your recommendations for folks? So what what did you learn from this? What are the lessons that people can take from this? Well, I think it mostly comes down to the fact that these IoT devices are out there on the open internet. And what I mean by that is these IoT devices that are being infected with bots, anybody can connect to them via a public IP address, meaning that there's no firewall or there's no home router that is protecting these devices from what is kind of the background traffic of the internet. So for the home user, I think the, the biggest piece of advice we can give is make sure that these IoT devices are put behind a firewall or home router or some network filtering device that doesn't leave them just out on the open internet unprotected. Now, what about for enterprise users? If I've got security cameras in my organization, are there some basic steps I should be taking to isolate those? Sure, yeah. It's essentially the same sort of thing. Make sure that any sort of administrative interface, whether it's via Telnet or a web-based administrative interface, is not accessible publicly. Make sure that it's restricted to only the, the subnets that you would want to manage them from is probably the best piece of advice. And of course, keep your software up to date. For those IoT devices that support software updates, make sure they keep those installed. Yeah, it's an interesting dilemma because uh, I know know, we see, for example, that uh, California is pushing ahead with legislation that will make it so that you have to basically change a password. The first thing you have to do when you interact with a new device is give it a new username and password to kind of try to get people away from these default usernames and passwords. But at the same time, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of these devices that are out there, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. No, absolutely. It's uh, Even if we fixed all IoT security problems right now, there would still be millions of devices sitting on store shelves that have not been properly secured. It's really easy to sort of blame the vendor here, and they have their own issues too. I mean, a lot of these IoT devices are cobbled together from pieces from different hardware vendors and sometimes even different software vendors. So it's a really sort of complicated ecosystem. And I honestly don't think that uh, they expected to have this many devices be available on the public internet. And I think that that's sort of the core of the problem here. Do you see any patterns in terms of, um, you know, if I go with a well-known brand of a device, am I more likely to have better security from the get-go or, you know, the, the cheaper brands, you know, something I buy for the lowest price on Amazon, is that likely to be less secure? Is there any alignment there or is it sort of hit or miss across the whole spectrum? 
Yeah, I would say it's a hit or miss across the whole spectrum. I mean, some of these vendors are pretty big vendors that you would expect to sort of have their ducks in a row, and they don't. Yeah, it's interesting, because I've seen even some of these big names, when you dig into what's underneath the hood, it's actually you know a rebranding of uh, some hardware or software that's being used in many, many different devices that are just being... Uh, you know, different organizations are just slapping their name on the device, but they're all coming out of the same factory. Yep, exactly. We, we see a lot of that between reuse of hardware and reuse of software. And I think one other aspect that kind of gets lost here is that if your IoT device is hacked and it's participating in a, in a bot like Mirai, like it's, it's not really visible to the end user. With attacks like ransomware, you know, that encrypt your files and send a big flashing warning telling you to send Bitcoin, you can easily tell that, yeah, okay, I, I have a problem here. But if your IoT device gets hacked, say your, your webcam gets hacked, there's really no indication to the end user that, that something is wrong. Right, it's still functioning as a webcam. It's, it's doing the job that you bought it to do. Exactly. And yeah. it might not have these, these sort of security features to even tell you if there's a problem. So, but Where do you suppose we're headed with this? What sort of changes do you suppose need to be made for us to be able to get a better handle on these problems? I think in a very real sense, The IoT security landscape is where the regular IT landscape was in the 1990s. You know, back in the 90s, some of the attacks that were successful were these default usernames and passwords, or these really simple vulnerabilities in like uh, web code. And I think we're with impending legislation, like like you said, from California, and then this very real attention to this. I think we're going to get better over time. To me, the real bellwether will be when we start seeing like memory corruption attacks being used to attack IoT devices, I think that'll be a sign that things are getting better. And what I mean by that is like memory corruption attacks, like buffer overflows, those are sort of tricky to exploit. They're very dependent on like the type of CPU that's in the device. And I think when we start to see those memory corruption attacks, which I think we will, I think that'll be a sign that things are getting better because there's really nothing specific about IoT I think that that makes it attractive to these attackers. The attackers we're seeing really just want an army of bots to launch DDoS attacks. The fact that they're IoT might help them a bit for reasons I said earlier about not having many security features. But really, I think they're pretty agnostic as to what their victims are. So if the IoT security landscape does get better, I think maybe attackers might start to focus on the other low-hanging fruit, uh, whatever that might be at the time. Our thanks to Matt Bing from NetScout for joining us. The research is titled Dipping into the Honeypot. You can find it on the website of NetScout's ACERT team. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to Juniper Networks for sponsoring our show. You can learn more at juniper.net slash security or connect with them on Twitter or Facebook. And thanks to Envale for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at envale.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. The coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben, editor is John Petrick, technical editor is Chris Russell, executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.